Hey everybody, welcome to another Teach Kelvin Your Thing session. In this session, I'll be having Glover teach me all about Tussle and how they're bringing the DX of SQLite to the edge. How are you doing, Glover? Doing all right. Thanks a lot for having me, Kelvin. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm really grateful you're here. I've, oh, I've seen Tussle before now, but um, I've really wondered what it is and why it's so amazing. So before we get into Tussle, let's um, have you introduce yourself and tell us who you are, what you've been doing, and anything you're willing to share. Awesome. So uh, I'm Glauber Costa, and I'm currently the founder of Torso. Before that, I started my career in, in the Linux kernel, and I spent around 10 years doing that. Uh, I worked with storage systems, with virtualization systems, uh, a little bit of file systems and things like that. So I mean, I, I'm not a front-end developer by any means. I come from this background of like a systems programming. Uh, after that, I spent another uh, decade pretty much at a company called SilaDB that uh, wrote a NoSQL database for petabyte scale databases. And now with Turso, one of our ideas is that uh, the world is very different than it was. And for a lot of workloads, uh, people have been uh, revisiting their database decisions and like the market is driving this force of like revisiting the database decisions that, that we made in the past. Uh, SQL is having a comeback because the, the, the workloads, as it turns out, for lots of them didn't grow uh, as exponentially as, as we thought they would. Uh, machines grew much faster. Um, and the edge is becoming a thing, right? So Turso is essentially a database that is designed to run on the edge, uh, easy replication to lots of locations. Uh, that's one of the things I'm hoping to teach you today. Uh, and that's what we're doing. Cool stuff. So from what you just said, it's, it's clear that you've been working with databases for a while with um, SILADB. And you mentioned revisiting the database decisions. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Like what was not yeah. so right that we are trying to revisit and make better with databases? Or it's not. It's not that it wasn't right. Is that, for example, when I would go into an account because I worked a lot in the in the sales cycles of SIL as well, in marketing and you know running benchmarks and and, and all of that, uh, we would always have this graph that said that data is growing exponentially, uh, and obviously you want to use that to justify the fact that you need a, a horizontally scaling database, right? So NoSQL databases usually are databases that break with SQL, which is something that everybody loves and, and likes and understands since the 70s. Uh, and if you're breaking with that, you might as well have a reason. There is one phrase in the industry that everybody loves is like never bet against SQL. Everybody kind of hates SQL, but it, it keeps, it, it never dies, right? So there, mm -hmm. every, every five years, there's somebody say, oh, the SQL language is horrible. SQL, it, it's not great. Uh, let's try something different, but you know, it's just too much inertia. Uh, it never dies, and so is there. But during the NoSQL era, what people realize is that, like for a lot, lots of use cases, uh, the things that SQL brings you uh, uh, ossify you in a lot of ways. So you might want, for example, to do a horizontal scalability. Scalability mm -hmm. that turns your database into a distributed system, uh, and it's very hard to do distributed SQL, which is again another thing it was done in in the past couple of years as well. Uh, so I mean, there are databases today that are SQL and distributed, but but you you break some of the old guarantees that you have. I mean, it, it's not it's not not no longer your boring Postgres or even like SQLite, uh, and so so you, you might want to re revisit that. And so we had those we we always we always had those graphs. You know, hey, data is growing exponentially. So if you already have like things in the terabytes today. Uh, they're going to be in the tens of, of terabytes in a couple of, of years, and then they're going to be hundreds of terabytes, and they're going to be petabytes. So you need this horizontal scalability. Uh, but what happened is that uh, that is absolutely true. I don't want to say that this is false. This is true, but it's not true. It's only true for the aggregate. So when you look at all the use cases involving data, that's true. So things, and, and, and because you have more sensors, you have devices generating things, and you have people browsing the web, generating user sessions. So the total aggregate of data is growing. But if you remove that, that segment of the market that is generating like automatic data, mm -hmm. uh, and then what you have is your shopping cart, what you have is your inventory, what you have is like all of that, that kind of stuff, user profiles that did not grow exponentially, right? So like uh, machines grew a lot faster, 
then uh, so the, the the data the sensors are generating are growing faster than than the machine capacity, but machines are still growing faster than inventory, than users, mm -hmm. than than all of those things that uh, usually are traditionally have been uh, the the bread and butter of the web. Mm -hmm. uh, so and. Again, in 2010, when MongoDB, for example, became a thing, you could not make a website. That's actually where the expression web scale uh, come from, comes from. Right? People will mock uh, MongoDB a lot. In the beginning, it was pretty rough. I mean, it lost everybody's data. Uh, <laughs> obviously, today, MongoDB is very far from that. Mm -hmm. uh, and there was always like the, the, the Twitter reply guys. There wasn't Twitter back then, but it was always the equivalent. Mm -hmm. uh, you would say, why don't you just use this boring database? Yeah, but is it web scale? Like, so where does the term web scale come from? This feel like I really need this thing that scale, 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 scale. Mm -hmm. uh, and today, I mean, famously, Stack Overflow runs in a single database instance, right? So like you could not, you could not have done this in, in, in the early, like in the early 2000s because every single uh, uh, machines were so, not powerful, like so weak in comparison, that any decent sized website will need scalability. Today, things are not like that. To the point that if you go look, I mean, it's, this is not just about my company. Uh, mm -hmm. SQLite is, and we'll talk about SQLite in, in more yeah, detail sure. specifically. It's the smallest database in the world. That's what it is, right? Uh, mm -hmm. SQL at least. And it's having a renaissance. Where people are looking at it and say, uh, come on, I don't need NoSQL, maybe Postgres is enough. And then for a lot of use cases, you look at that and say, okay, maybe, maybe I don't even need Postgres. Maybe maybe mm -hmm. SQLite is enough, I mean, which is this thing that's an embedded database. So uh, th this revisiting, I think, comes from the fact that uh, you look around and you realize that the ratio of data to computing power changed a lot. Mm, interesting stuff. Um, you know, most like the data we, we are, like sending in our applications and all that, it's always keep increasing, right? Like just look at um, Twitter, our tweets. I can't even <laughs> think of how much tweets is in there in their databases. And it's, it, the, so the scaling- But the thing, amount of Twitter mm -hmm. users, yeah. But the yeah. amount of Twitter users is not growing. That, and you exactly have a point. Exactly, so right? Twitter, Twitter has a database internally called Manhattan, uh, which is essentially that their own private implementation of what Cassandra and, and Scylla were for, for folks who understand like a yeah. potential consistent databases. Uh, tweets I would expect to be in Manhattan, which is like this massive hyperscaler yeah. uh, eventual consistent database. Uh, and for those in the audience that don't know, eventual consistency essentially means like because this is a massive distributed system, mm -hmm. I can't really hope to keep consistency among the regions. So I'll, I'll we'll just not do it. And, and the application yeah. now is responsible, right? So two people can be seeing two versions of the timeline. They're slightly different, yeah. but that's fine because if you see things in different order, like you yeah. don't need consistency there. But yeah. for example, uh, the amount of people on Twitter, it's not growing that fast. Mm -hmm. And the amount of people who sign up for Twitter Blue is not growing that fast, right? Uh, so, so, uh, so you could have those things, this information mm -hmm. like, uh, uh, are, are you sign up on Twitter? Like the, the, the system that manages Twitter blue doesn't need to be in an eventual consistent database. The system yeah. that manages Twitter user profiles don't have to be uh, in an eventual consistent massive scale database, right? But the tweets, by all means, mm -hmm. uh, and that's what I mean by like the, 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 the claim is true, but only in aggregate. And, and, but it used to be the case that, th that this was true perceivably for every, for every kind of application. Mm, yeah, of course, data. So, now, with the scaling thing, what role does the edge play for scaling databases? Yeah, uh, great question. So, like the the edge, uh, I it's not in in my view too much about scaling, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it's about the fact that the, as applications move to the edge, and you have things like Cloudflare workers or Netlify Edge, mm -hmm. uh, what those platforms are indicating at and hinting at is that there is a class of applications uh, for which uh, you want the experiences to be generated as close as possible to the user. So mm -hmm. again, used to be the case that you go to a server to fetch your stuff, but now you don't wanna do this anymore. You want uh, your assets uh, on a CDN, right? Because you want your assets to be as close as possible from the user. So you have a static page uh, and that static page, the render version of that is on, the, on a CDN. Uh, and what is a CDN is essentially something that is uh, to spread all over the world mm -hmm. uh, and you will have one close to you uh, in your country and I'll have one close to me uh, here uh, in Canada uh, and and 
you're going to put your, your static assets, you're going to put your images, you're going to put your render page and et cetera. Mm. Uh, and what we're, what we're seeing is like those CDNs improved in capabilities over time to allow you now to execute code because you don't want to, uh, you want in that world in which your assets are in the edge, every time you need to execute code, server side code to make your experience personalized, you need to go back to the server, right? So that's slow. That's 100 milliseconds, 200, 300, however, depending on how far you are uh, from your server. Yeah. Uh, so what you want to do is move your code close to yeah. the CDN. So now the CDNs now are able to execute code. That is Cloudflare mm -hmm. Workers, essentially. What That's what that is. That is Netlify Edge. And so mm -hmm. the, the, my Edge, which was only about static data, needs yeah. to execute code. Uh, but if you're running things from from uh, those edge locations, what that means is that your personalization is restricted to stuff that doesn't touch data. Mm -hmm. uh, not restricted in the sense that you can't do it, but in the sense that if you need to do it, uh, you need to go back to the central database, which is yeah. far, and then you all problems all over again. Right? So the idea of an edge database is like, what can we do to make the database get closer to you, right? And this essentially happens in our case with Tursa with read replication. Yeah. Uh, and it's not that we invented read replication. Read replication is the easiest idea to do in the book. Uh, is that the reason you wouldn't do read replication is that because doing those, keeping those replicas and managing those replicas, mm -hmm. it's very expensive. So the idea behind Tursa is that can we make uh, the cheapest database the world has ever seen? Mm -hmm. uh, and then what we're going to use this for is that since it's so cheap, we're going to put it all over the world. Uh, so that, that's essentially the idea of Torso. And then there, there's a lot of intelligence behind uh, because obviously uh, you, you, you want to create those read replicas, but now you need to understand, you need to, you as the user or, or, the, or the front end developer needs to understand where those databases are located uh, and, and pick the right, the right replica, pick the right, the closest replica. So mm -hmm. with Torso, we, want, we don't want to do this as well because I mean, the good thing about the edge is that you just write your code and you deploy it to the edge and it will automatically run in the closest replica. So you don't want to be doing this thing about, hey, which replica do I contact? And if I get this wrong, my latency is not good. Uh, Turso has all the ability as well to always route you to the right replica. Right? So th that is the, the kind of thing that, uh, that we're doing. Hmm. That is really interesting because, you know, you gave a little bit of um, background to what we've been having on the edge for a while. So mm -hmm. we start um, from images and HTML pages, which are all static to code, like the serverless function or the edge functions. And now we also, we have the database on the edge. And it's interesting because all these replicas, you are managing it because I would think that would be like a problem because from the code, how would you know what replica is, is closer right. to your user, right? So you are handling that and that's interesting. I really can't wait to see it. So you mentioned that SQLite is the cheapest database. And also is is using it and um, bringing your database closer to your user. So why? Okay, yes, of course. Apart from SQLite being cheap, right? What other um, factors made you feel that it was the right DB to build Torso on? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. So so uh, another thing, like uh, again, you can validate or disagree with me, but like uh, one mm -hmm. of the things that we hear a lot is that, uh, look, testing databases is a horrible experience. Like, mm -hmm. so I test my code in CI, I, you know, I have my unit tests for yeah. or my integration tests or whatnot, uh, but testing the database is just a pain. It, it's really horrible it's really uh, because then I have just been a container and et cetera. SQLite runs on a file. So uh, one of the things that we love about uh, Turso, uh, and I'm hoping to show you soon that yeah, in practice, definitely. Is that like Turso works on a local file, and works at the edge, uh, and it's the same code because again it's the same database running underneath, right? It's not like a mock version. That obviously mm -hmm. the data may be different, like you may have a different different data on your production database of than course. you have in your local file. Uh, I mean, you could you could download it and and if if you want and and, and work with the same data, but uh, the, the expectation is that you're not going to do this. <laughs> yes. uh, but uh, uh, you, you, you have you, you have everything working on local files. You can develop mm -hmm. your application without ever t touching the web uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and test your application in your CI without ever spinning a container uh, yeah. or, or any other form of a network database, everything embedded. And then 
when you're ready, you just change a new URL and your database is, is in a bunch of locations all over the globe, right? Mm. So that the developer experience of, of SQLite uh, is, is something that we, we wanted to keep. We wanted to, uh, uh, and, and I love local, I love local environments. Uh, and I know this is a big fight there. People think, no, but you know, the cloud's going to take over everything anyway. So what we need to do is like a, have a oh, better experience uh, in developing remotely. Mm -hmm. Like I maybe maybe it's my dinosaur mind for you know, like, uh, uh, I, I'm not the, uh, the the your usual your usual like gray beard or Unix guy just because I don't have a beard nor do I have any <laughs> hair. Uh, but I'm that old, right? So it could be that. But I also yeah. like, I truly believe that uh, the local experience is important. Yes. Uh, and so we want to have this. We want to have this on ramp between like okay, you're running this thing locally. Mm -hmm. But now when you're ready, like, and, you, and it's not just about development, again, it's about testability as well and, and being yes. able to, to, to essentially make sure that everything is so much easier to work with. Uh, also, again, SQLite is uh, extremely rock solid. It's, it's, it's a very small code base. It's a very lean code base and you want to keep it this way. Mm -hmm. uh, by the way, when we say SQLite, uh, Turso is based on a fork of SQLite that we have called LibSQL. Uh, mm -hmm. SQLite, uh, uh, the, the only thing that I don't like too much about what they do, although I fully respect that, of course, uh, is that they don't usually take, uh, it's very hard for them to take external contributions. They mm -hmm. want to keep the code not open source, but public domain instead. So they want to make sure that, the, the, you know, the, this will be a little bit messier if, if you're taking external contributors sure. or you want to make sure that the code base is, is always slim or, or what, however the reasons they have. Uh, there are essentially three people who contribute to SQLite, right? So what we have is a fork. Is a, so far is a very lightweight fork. Uh, okay. So I mean, we've been able to back merge from SQL, SQLite all the time, but we add to that fork the ability to do native replication. That's the thing, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so now we can deploy those. We can deploy those databases in a couple of regions across the planet, uh, and allow you again. But you, you still work remotely. Still, you, you can still do a lot, a, a lot with it locally. Uh, it still works locally. That's what I meant. Uh, mm. And then you move it to the edge. You're ready to do that. Amazing stuff. You know, I am right there with you. I still love local environment because you know, I I'm not a fan of the the the, the cloud too much. It's good, but it uh, has its own drawbacks. And uh, yeah, so thank you. So now I I want to see Torso in action, right? So we've been talking about it. And um, yeah, are you ready to like show me Turso like the workflow? Let's do it. Uh, no. Let's okay. do it. All right. So share your screen now. Mm. Yeah. So the first the first thing I want to show you, Calvin, is like especially for your audience that may not be completely familiar with that. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'll I'll, I'll I'll just a warning in advance. I'm not a, a JavaScript guy at all, right? I'll, I'll try my best. Uh, oh, I know yeah. the very basic. Like, uh, and we'll dive into that. Mm -hmm. uh, but but you see, my, my JavaScript stuff is very basic. Mm -hmm. uh, but like, what what? So what is SQLite? SQLite is essentially a database in a file, right? Yeah. So if I do something like SQLite, uh, and then I call Calvin .db, uh, SQLite three is the command. Sorry. So SQLite three. Yeah. Uh, this is SQLite, and it's it's essentially again a whole database in a file. It's an embedded database. This shell SQLite tree is like a shell that embeds the database. The database is part of the shell. And mm -hmm. when you write an application, you make that part of, of your application. That Essentially, that's how it works. Mm -hmm. uh, so I can come here and say create table. Like this file did not exist before, so it was created. Uh, podcasts, and, and then I will say name, text, right? So now a table was created, and I can do insert uh, into podcasts, name, uh, values, Kelvin, and then select star from podcasts, right? They have this. So this is, again, this is a file. This this yeah. is what it is, right? And if I quit here, you will see that this file exists here now. Uh, I, I will log in again and even already select star from from podcasts. Podcasts, yeah. Right, mm -hmm. uh, and here's the data. I can send you this file. Obviously, this file is fairly small, uh, and and right, you're seeing right here. There's one thing. Obviously, this has very little data, uh, but but it's uh, it's just something like a very easy to move around. Uh, it has this. It has these disadvantages, right? So like uh, right. I, I keep saying, people say, "Oh, do you think do you do you really think this is better than Postgres? Because Postgres is such a, such an amazing database or MySQL." Yeah. Uh, 
And I don't think things are necessarily, I don't, that's not how I think in terms of better or worse. It's mm -hmm. like things have advantages and disadvantages. So for example, SQLite is not a very great database for writes. So if you're doing like a lo lots and lots and lots and lots of writes, uh, probably doesn't work for you. But most of those edge cases that we've discussed about, they are use cases in which you read a lot. And for that, SQLite is amazing, mm -hmm. right? So again, that, that, is, that goes once more into the idea of uh, an edge uh, database. Uh, so the other thing that I'm going to show you is that I have a very, uh, I, I have a very simple package.json right here. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to uh, need your help a little bit with that uh, every now and then, but I just created this npm. Uh, so it's an example thing. Then there's a file index.js, index.js, right? Uh, and this is the kind of code that you would write uh, with, with Curso in JavaScript. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm using .env uh, yeah. and then... I create client, a libsql client. I mean, libsql is this fork of SQLite that, that I mentioned. So it has drivers to do both remote uh, and local development. Uh, the, the, second thing, the second thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to create a client, uh, which is right here. And then I, I'm going to execute a SQL query. This obviously the SQL query is very simple, right? Very, very yeah. simple. Uh, let's take a look at my environment file. Okay. Uh, I was testing this. A different file, so we're gonna Calvin TV, uh, and then I'm gonna go back to index. Now this is gonna work, and let's just say select star from podcasts, podcasts. Uh, and then I will come here and say con star s equal, uh, equals this. Uh, You're gonna need. To yeah yeah single tick this yeah. now and you will see that hopefully if i didn't mistype anything you're gonna go node index.js this is an object like that now yeah. uh, i don't remember and i don't want to waste uh, anybody's time although although we could like i have another example like on on figure out the the, the shape of this object mm -hmm. uh there is a, there is a way to just turn this into json right so yeah you could just like um json to stringify like JSON you want it to be string. like object yeah. or you want to make it a string let's yes. try this one yeah that's yeah so there you go yeah. like so you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna get something like this you get the mm -hmm. columns back uh and then mm -hmm. you see like uh, the name uh, kelvin and then how many rows affected zero because you, you didn't write to anything like that so you're just, just fetching right but everything everything that i've done here happened locally yes uh, i haven't did. you haven't you haven't seen torso yet this is mm. SQLite. Again, this is standard SQLite. Uh, some, some of the features that we, we have that are specific about LibSQL will not work with SQLite. But again, there are very few, and most of them are, are invisible to the user. Right? So by, by and large, you can do 99% of your work with SQLite. Uh, Kelvin, you probably don't even know, but I bet my life that you have SQLite installed in your, in your yeah. laptop right now. I sure Almost do. everybody has it. Yeah. Right, so it's uh, it's all over. It's it, and you can do this like uh, mm -hmm. now. This file kelvin.db, you can you can commit it to your git uh, to your git repository, for example. Run your and use it in your unit tests. Uh, use it in your CI. Do mm -hmm. what you want with it. Mm -hmm. Now let's yeah. take a look at Turso. Uh, Turso uh, again. I have the the CLI install. Let me just uh, clear screen here. So the first thing that I want to show you is that if I, if I do Turso DB locations and I'm already authenticated, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and locations and then less, you will see that I have all of those locations where I can place my database. Wow. Right? Uh, and this is not, again, you are going to choose a primary location. The primary location is where your rights are going to. So every time, again, every time you write, you still need to pay this latency of going to your uh, master replica. So your rights are gonna be a little bit slower, potentially, mm -hmm. right? Uh, but keep it in mind, this is a use case, this is a database that is designed to serve your reads from the edge uh, with, uh, uh, with a very, very good latencies. Uh, but, but, and the system already determined uh, that Toronto is the uh, region or location that is closest to me. I live two and a half hours away from Toronto, uh, mm -hmm. so this is uh, uh, likely the, the, the closest location. Montreal, a little bit further. But like then I could be in Warsaw, in Sydney, San Jose, Singapore, Seattle, Santiago, in Mexico, 
uh, in Romania, in the US, in Japan, how, wherever I am, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so the first thing that uh, we're going to do now is I'm going to do through. So let's clear the screen again, just so the, the text all goes back to the top. Through so DB create, that's all you need. Uh, and this will create a database uh, with the primary in the closest location to me in this case. Mm -hmm. If you want, uh, obviously, uh, that's not always what you want because you could be traveling and creating your production database. So you can pass a location flag, uh, but we're not going to do it right now. Uh, and I'm assuming that Toronto uh, is the, the, the a good location for me. Mm -hmm. uh, or, or you know what? Let's just let's just do it. What's the let's what's the closest location to you here, Kelvin? What's the? No, let's see. It's, is it Johannesburg? Probably South Africa, I guess. Probably, yeah. Yeah, yeah that has or, to be. It's... Yeah. Yeah. I, I I don't know if you're potentially geographically closer to some of the southern European, but let's let's just do it. Mm -hmm. uh, so third so DB create, and then I'm going to pick a name, Kelvin, mm -hmm. uh, location, GND, right? So oh, now okay. I'm creating this database in South Africa, right? Oh, wow. I like the so shortcuts. That's really good. Mm -hmm. GNB. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, those are the airport codes, right? Yeah. Uh, so uh, you will see all of those names in here, right? So if you see the ID, yeah. that's the, the airport code of all of those locations. Oh, but look, this day, it, it took around f four seconds. It, uh, it, it, it will usually take something between like, a, depends on, on a bunch of factors, but something between four to eight seconds to create a database. So now you have your database uh, and your database is, is in South Africa. Uh, so fantastic. This awesome. database is all accessible over HTTP. So again, we have to design the, the keep in mind, SQLite is not a networked database. So yes. when we designed this to be a network database, we did all over HTTP. So this will work on your client. This will work uh, anywhere. Uh, essentially, uh, uh, any any edge provider, uh, for sure, sometimes they don't have TCP available. For sure, they have Fetch or HTTP. So this mm -hmm. works from anywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a, and I could use curl here. I, I won't, uh, but uh, like uh, just because you have to pass a token, it gets complicated, but like, you could essentially do curl uh, or any other, like, or put this in your browser and you're going to be accessing this database over HTTP, right? Nice. Um, so now let's put this, uh, this, I, this database is going to have a, a, a URL. So let's do mm -hmm. it. So DB show, uh, Kelvin, that's the name of my DB. Yeah. And you're going to see that there is a, uh, there is a URL in here. Uh, Leap SQL uh, is our protocol, and essentially what it means is that this is going to be using WebSockets, uh, and that, mm. that's the default that we're showing you. Uh, but it works again; it works even in environments that do not have WebSockets. You, you just have to replace this part of the URL with HTTPS. So that's what we're going to do, uh, just to keep things simple. Mm. Uh, and you come here, and let's go to my dot env. Okay. Delete the DB as well. The other thing that I need uh, is I need a token, yeah. uh, uh, which is essentially like a security token. So uh, yeah, you could grab that also. Man. And yeah, Curso DB tokens create uh, Kelvin. So that will create me a token, and I'm completely fine leaking this token yeah, because by the time <laughs> by the time we're done here and your audience <laughs> yeah. actually sees this, uh, the database will be gone. Yes, so uh, let's come here and do an yeah. end, and the token will be this. Right? So it's it looks like a JWT token, right? It is a JWT token. It is, token. it is, yeah, yeah, yeah cool. it is. Mm -hmm. uh, so everything is in our dot env again, again, just to confirm that uh, you have a DB URL environment variable and you have a token environment variable. And if you go back to our index.js, uh, you have DB URL and token. Now, if I run this, obviously, Kelvin, you know that the square is going to fail. Yes. Why is the square it. going to fail? Because we don't have any the tables table. created. Yeah. Uh, so again, you can use uh, uh, migration tools or ORM tools uh, that have uh, some form of migration in here as well. Prisma, unfortunately, is at, at, at least so far, uh, doesn't work with, with Turso. Again, it works with SQLite, uh, but it, Prisma will not do the translations to HTTP. Drizzle does, Kisali does as a query builder. Next works fairly well. Uh, so uh, if you are familiar with uh, uh, with the ecosystem, 
Uh, I would recommend, for example, using Drizzle mm -hmm. uh, that has a to do your migrations uh, and, and, and the ORM capabilities. But uh, you come here and what we're going to do now is going to do Turso DB shell and the name of the database is Kelvin. Right. So now I'm in the shell and I'm going to do create table podcasts, name, text, same thing as before. And we're going to insert uh, insert into podcasts name values. And what I'm going to do now, just so everybody, it's clear that I'm not cheating. Um, let's give a slightly different name. Right. So instead of yeah. Kelvin, we're going to we're going to say Kelvin, touch Kelvin, your thing. Yes. Right. So that's the, that's the name here. Now it's in the database. Um, and if I run this, the J jot is invalid. So why is that? Yeah. Let's check it out. Did I... Everything looks good. All right, so uh, we had a, we had a bunch of issues here, folks, and we mostly dealt with that uh, off camera. Uh, Kelvin mm -hmm. apparently uh, is also uh, the buggy master, uh, mm -hmm. and for some reason, what happened? For some reason, what happened uh, is that I don't know if it was an encoding issue, uh, if it's something related to how my terminal was pasting those characters every time you were pasting the token into the environment the environment variables file, it was still saying like invalid token. Uh, we, we tried a bunch of stuff. We tried to uh, pipe the stuff. I mean, you, you missed them all. <laughs> that, that was a fun session for another day. We tried mm -hmm. to uh, pipe uh, the token straight into uh, my file uh, and then just come and, and, and add the, the name of the environment variable before, after. Nothing worked. Uh, we very quickly figured out that uh, trying to contact the database over curl uh, was working. So like something in my terminal, I guess I do not know. Mm -hmm. uh, and what we've done now is that we just essentially... Uh, let, let's go uh, into the code. We remove, if you if you remember how the code was before, it was .env, uh, and then uh, we were essentially doing .env, uh, the, the thing to, to read from the file. Uh, we removed that, uh, and now we have DB URL and token straight into environment variables in the terminal that we exported, mm -hmm. and hopefully this should be working. For example, you can come here, DB URL. Yeah. Uh, there you go. Just uh, uh, to recap, uh, Turzo DB list, I have this database, uh, Kelvin, uh, in Johannesburg, uh, and we inserted data. Uh, we inserted a, a, a column uh, with the name of the podcast, uh, and the name is a little bit different than the one that was in the file. So we're going to come here and do, uh, we're going to execute that code, index.js, uh, and you will see uh, that uh, essentially uh, this comes uh, and, and reads from the database. Again, just to confirm, if I come here and do export the URL once more, uh, and and that is uh, file uh, Kelvin.db, and if I run the same code, you will see now that the name, the, the the value that, that has been returned is Kelvin, because again, this is now reading from a file, uh, and if I once more export the DB URL as this, and run the code again. Right now, this is different. So the same code that is running on your local file is now running on the remote database. Uh, but this database is still only in Johannesburg. Like it's it's not anywhere else. Yeah. Uh, and what I can do now is that I can come here and do third so uh, db replicate Kelvin. And now we can replicate it in Toronto. And I think the it's I don't need that. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So now you see that four seconds later, uh, this this database also exists close to me. Uh, and if I come here now and do node index.js, this will run, again, the same data, but this data is now coming a lot closer from me. Our free tier, for those of you like uh, who go to terso.tech right now, Mm -hmm. uh, so if you will go, we're going to terso.tech, uh, you would see that you can, in the free tier alone, put your database into three locations. So you can come here and you do Turso DB locations. Uh, let's pick any other location, for example, Paris, CDG. Now your database is in 
Paris as soon as this finishes, right? And what you will notice is that the URL doesn't change. Uh, yeah. You can keep querying kelvin glomertursoio uh, and our routing will make sure that you're reading from the closest replica. You can, especially if you're debugging something like we were, although we were not debugging this exact issue. Uh, if you do Turso DB show uh, Kelvin, you have URLs that will go straight to those replicas, right? So if you if you if you use one of those, then you are going straight to that location, uh, and you can write from any location. By the way, you don't have to. Your writes can go to to uh, any location. Uh, we we can demonstrate right that right now. So if I come here back to the terminal, and if I would do export my DB URL equals, uh, and we're doing HTTPS uh, just to keep it simple. Well, let's get the Toronto location. And I hope this is pasted correctly. Uh, and then we're going to do node index.js once again. Uh, but now I'm going to remove that. I'm going to do like a, a insert. Let's do it again the insertion here. Insert into podcasts. Uh, and then it's a name and and the value is going to be something like other podcast, right? And boom. I think it will complain that uh, right, RS, that's not even. And so now you have those two things. I mean, this 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 thing went straight into Toronto. Uh, we proxy that. So we can, you can, the rights are still going. Just want to make it sure, clear for your audience. The rights are still going to the uh, primary location, but you don't have to be aware of that. Like we do all the routing for mm -hmm. you, right? Uh, and then I come here just to remove that, right? Uh, and then I, I can essentially do this from uh, any of those locations. Wow, that's really amazing. Like because I was thinking, you know, since you you um, replicate everything, right? So if we do a right, how does those region get to sync with the data? But it feels as if it's all the regions or the replication. Are like a proxy to the primary SQLite file. Is that it? Uh, for for writes, yes. Okay, for uh, writes. For writes, but then again, okay. but then once, but then this data is then spread to the other locations, like with passive replication. Mm -hmm. uh, and when you read this data, uh, and then you have, of course, like a regional rights guarantees. I'm not going to go into uh, those details, mm -hmm. but if you are within the same connection, and if you write, then when you read again, like uh, you 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 will read uh, the stuff you wrote. Uh, obviously, there is a delay in replication between those regions, uh, but when you're reading that data, right, you will be reading the data from your closest location, and you didn't have to do uh, again. We just used the, the URL for a specific replica, but you don't have to do this. Uh, it goes uh, straight to to uh, like we 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 go we're gonna take care of all this routing for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Like because you know. I like that the fact that SQLite is a file, right? Like you said, the ship is mm -hmm. database. And now you just take it and give us like a distributed database sort of thing that puts the database at the edge close to your user. And it just makes a lot of sense. So is there like a limit to how many locations you could pick or how does that work? Is like, what is the, yeah. the drawback or yeah. So in the free in the free tier uh, in the free tier uh, you can already pick three locations uh, okay. as uh, as I just mentioned uh, that's all you can do with Turso at the moment so uh, Turso officially is in public beta mm -hmm. uh, so very soon hopefully in in a month or two we're going to be announcing a scalar plan the scalar plan will allow you to pick six locations okay. and the maximum amount of locations that we support uh, is uh, thirty something at the moment I, I can go and count back to the list but I think thirty two mm -hmm. locations. Uh, is what we have at the moment. Hmm. I like it. So, um, just off the top of your head, right? Like, what sort of use cases are you seeing for for Torso right now in terms of users? Like, what what sort of applications are they building with Torso, and how are they liking it so far? Uh, so the the response, I've been very happy to see the response of the community, both on Twitter and in our Discord channel. Mm -hmm. uh, the link to the Discord channel is on our website. Yeah. Uh, on Twitter, we are at Turso Database, and you can also follow me at GLCST. Mm -hmm. uh, but like they, they, what we see people building with it are exactly like uh, what we expected. In a, so in a sense, that's great. 
uh, is exactly those applications, usually at the, 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 the storefront, the web, the, the, mm -hmm. the things in which you need uh, low latency from any location, right? Mm -hmm. uh, things that I like that we haven't seen yet, but like a, a fraud detection, again, because you want to respond very fast and, and want to make a decision very fast about that. Yeah. Uh, we have, we've been seeing some people show up uh, we also support SQLite extensions uh, in, in the experimental in the Trusso database. One such extension is for vector search. So one of the mm -hmm. things that you can do is move some of your LLM models to the edge. Uh, other things that are interesting to see uh, are, are uh, feature flags or configuration, uh, distributed configuration, uh, any use cases like that. Again, what we're seeing a lot is just people that have like uh, online stores uh, showing up. We're super early. Those are early days. Yeah, and I'm sure. sure we're going to have a lot more use cases uh, coming mm -hmm. in the near future. Yeah, definitely. So thank you so much, Global, for showing me Toso. I really like it. I like the convenience. In fact, I'm a Postgres person most of the time, but with Toso, I feel I could, you know, build some applications with SQLite and enjoy the DB on the edge. And, and for, because for apps that don't need a lot of rights you know like maybe like apis yeah. that just need a lot of reads you could just do this and it's way much better and i think this is good i like it yeah and postgres and postgres of course is a great database uh, yeah again i'm not here to con on the contrary i mean i love postgres as well yeah. uh between postgres and my i'm a postgres guy as well it's uh, but but the thing the thing is like I just look at uh, if you look at the our scalar plan for 29 dollars a month mm -hmm. uh, where you can have six locations Right, so we need something as cheap as SQLite to be able to offer that. Uh, mm -hmm. SQLite uh, is, is SQL based, uh, so essentially what that means is that uh, you you already know most of it. Like uh, yeah. there are some differences between that and Postgres, and some advanced functionalities uh, are different. But the bread and butter of like insert selects and basic aggregations and stuff like that. I mean, it's all the same. Right? Yeah, I love it. So yeah, thank you so much. So what? Can we be expecting for from Toso like maybe in six months? Like, what's your roadmap? Any new features you could talk about? Of course, that is coming for us. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, like uh, I a roadmap. Uh, the, again, the one thing that I love about uh, SQLite is that it's very simple. Yeah. Uh, so it, uh, our roadmap is not very complicated. Uh, we are very laser focused at the moment in enabling uh, the scalar plan, uh, making sure that the I mean, developers can start using this. Uh, for your production use cases. One of the things that we do want to support is data branching. Okay. Uh, data branching mm, obviously is a feature that uh, a lot of lot of the modern databases have. And mm -hmm. with SQLite, once more, it's also fairly easy to do uh, since you have those files at the end of the day that you can, that you can pass around. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, you know, there, it's not that simple, like, a, but, of course. but having the database in a file uh, simplifies a lot of things. Uh, but this is all like uh, we, we are we are we have a lot ahead of us, uh, and in six months I think you can expect like uh, this functionality to land. But mm -hmm. in the next like two to three months, the idea is to just uh, have the infrastructure in a good place to yeah. start supporting production use cases on the scalar plan. Awesome stuff! So thank you so much, Glover. So for coming to TKYT, I know you toss it is your thing, but if you want to plug in anything else, of course. You could just tell us what you want to plug, and of course, you can go for it. Man, I wish I, I, I wish I had time to do anything else. I mean, I have three kids, so it's a between yeah. Torso and my kids. There's, uh, that's it. <laughs> okay, of course. So you all, all right. go check out Torso. I'm gonna leave the link to everything, the Discord, the Torso website, and every other resources you could give to me after now. I'm gonna put it in the description. And um, yeah, thank you so much, Global, for your time. Awesome. Thank you so much, Kelvin. Th and thanks for you and the audience as well. Goodbye.